Praise God. Praise God. That's right. Yes, that too. All right. Praise God. Other praises. Woo! <laughs> All right. Other praises. I can do it. All right. Well, many of you know that we've been trying for. Uh, the last month, month and a half, to get some the land that's connected to our land. Um, we have found Monday we we got the land. So um, we yeah I, so we're super excited because we want to start being ma- to make that available to you uh, for ministry opportunities. We told Jeremy you know bring the youth out and go camping. There's three ponds on it. Better use them this year because I don't know that <laughs> they'll have water in them next year. But um, we want to be able to use that. Uh, to glorify God and, and, and have ministry opportunities. So, uh, Cordell is excited for the deer opportunities as well. All right. Other other praises. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, for the beautiful morning you gave us, the beautiful temperatures. Lord, we thank you for the safety and travel that you've given all of us and through this thick fog that you've provided for us this morning. Lord, I just thank you uh, for, for the scenery that, that uh, you provide for us each and every day uh, with the sunrise, uh, the animals, just your creation. And Lord, I just praise you for that. Lord, I just thank you uh, for allowing us to, to be able to meet in a church that's free to, to worship and to, to praise you and to glorify you and to sing praises and to, to study your word and to proclaim your word. Lord, I just thank you that we live in a nation. Uh, that we we have the opportunity to do this. Lord, you are so good, you are so gracious, and we are so unworthy. But we thank you for the righteousness of Jesus Christ through which you see us because of his sacrifice. It's in his name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. No. 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 Not yet. No. Not until after worship. It's the last Sunday of the month. Oh, it's the last Sunday of the month. Joy said not till after worship service. <laughs> it's in the bulletin. Judith has it. All right, let's stand and continue to worship. God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart. To the end the soul on fire.
you don't mind having a seat for just a moment. Here a couple of months ago, the church voted to move into a refocusing process. We've had three sessions. We have a fourth one this afternoon. In the first two, we looked at ourselves. We looked at the concept of the commander of an army after the battle relinquishing or surrendering his sword saying the the other the other country the other battle the other army you are in control it was symbolic of saying just that we surrender to you if the Lord is to be the Lord of my life, then I too must surrender my sword. I must give my Lord total and complete control of my life. Yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening, we had our third session. And we looked at, and I believe we still left it downstairs on the wall, but major impacts in the life of the church since 1988. Many good. Some not so good. But we looked at that and how that shaped who we are today and where we are going. But even, even yesterday, the same point about surrendering your sword and allowing God to be God was still brought about. What we're part of here in this church is not and cannot be about me or you or us. But it has got to be about our Lord. If I am in control if we are in control, God cannot be God. Stand and continue to worship.
this morning, that you'd be lifted up, that you'd be honored, that you'd be glorified. Father God, that someday we will sing your name endlessly. Father God, we praise you this morning and we lift you up. Father, we thank you for the time that we've been able to, to sing to your wonderful name. Father God, now we ask that you'd move into this time of breaking open your word. And Father God, give us again ears to hear, hearts, Father God, that are open to what you have to say to us this morning. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Children may leave for Children's Church. I kind of hesitate to, to recap the past few messages because I did that last week. But yesterday as we went through, well, actually this whole week, um, several, point, several people have pointed out that we, we've made headway into restoring relationships. Uh, the, the past month has been about reconciliation, about forgiveness, and, and we've made headway into that. and, and I've seen it. Um, people have told me um, there's been relationships restored with family members. There have been relationships restored with friends. There have been... God is working. And uh, Satan's ticked. He don't like it. Um, and and he's, he's attacking us individually, but he's also trying to attack us as a church and, and, and causing other conflicts to arise and, and try, trying to counter the effects of this entire last month. And so I do want to go ahead and recap. And actually, it's kind of a good thing because, like I said, there are several new faces in, in the, the, uh, the congregation this morning. So this will bring them up to speed. Um, first, uh, it was... Oops. Turn me on. Uh, can you click on the screen and click and talk at the same time? Okay. Um, anyhow, the first the first message was on minding your manners at the Lord's table, and the Lord's table yet again today, it's a symbol of all that God has done through His Son Jesus Christ. It's a symbol of everything that had happened, His broken body his shed blood for our sins. And, and we learned that we need to take the Lord's Supper only after examining ourselves that we can be taking it properly and, and uh, ensuring that we're taking it in a worthy manner. The next week was gyroscopic grace, and we learned that Jesus wants us to have our relationships in an upright or right side up. And we, we discovered and looked at church discipline, and the first step of church discipline is actually that we ourselves go to the person who has hurt us, and that we, uh, we actually go and, and seek reconciliation, and that's the first step. Then we went to the dirty jobs. Forgiveness, it's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. And we looked at the parable of the unforgiving servant. This was a servant who had been forgiven so much debt that he could never in his lifetime even begin to repay it. He could pay his entire life and not even make a dent. We compared it to 10,000 employees and their entire wages for 15 years, and that's how much debt he was forgiven. Yet as soon as he was forgiven that debt, he went out and completely forgot that he had been forgiven and went after another servant to be given a debt or to be collecting on a debt that was much, much less. And it ended badly for him. And finally, last week, 
was sins are like scorpions. It's the little ones that kill you. We saw that it's often our bigger sins that uh, are, are, are less dangerous in our lives because not only are our big sins, they're visible to us, but they're visible to those around us. And, and we can be held accountable. We see the need for forgiveness. We see the need for repentance. But it's those little things, often the things that we keep internalized, like pride, unforgiveness, lust, selfishness, these things, they're, that we, we consider those the smaller sins, but as we saw in, in, that, in that teaching, Jesus made it very clear that it's those, those small ones that you don't necessarily the need, see the need for forgiveness. You don't necessarily see the need for repentance. You don't necessarily get held accountable for. And it's those that we saw in that passage that bring us the greatest grief and judgment. Jeremy preached on Saturday evening service last week that uh, he preached on worry. And he said, we just need to stop it. Stop it. And he showed a, a video from Bob Newhart. And, and uh, if you look at it, just Bob Newhart, stop it, YouTube. It's great. Um, we do. We just need to stop it. And as we look back at all that's happened this month, um, since the last weekend in July all the way to this weekend, we, we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. We, we need to sit back and answer this question. How will we play our part in the movie Letters to God, has anybody ever seen the movie Letters to God? Oh my goodness, you need to see Letters to God and grab a box of tissues while you're at it. Um, Tyler, a young boy who's developed cancer, and he has to answer this question for himself. How will I play out this role? Listen as we hear from Tyler and his grandpa. It seems to be frozen. We'll just, I'll just act it out. <laughs> like I said, Tyler's developed cancer, and he has this problem. He's got one specific kid in class that picks on him and teases him. And so he goes to his grandpa and plays the guitar. And <laughs> you like that? And. But he goes to his grandpa because he's hurt, and he's with his friend who's, who's wearing a do-rag, too, because he's got his do-rag on to, 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 to cover his bald head. And he, he says, you know, I, so his grandpa says, so you're having problems with kids at school? And he says, well, mostly it's just this one. And his grandpa said, don't worry about it. They're just jealous. And Tyler says, what, they're jealous because I've lost all my hair or because my eyebrows are almost all gone? And it's quite a response. I mean, but his grandpa says, no, they're jealous because you've been chosen for the role of your lifetime. You've been handpicked by God. Wow, what an answer. You've been handpicked by God. Basically, what he's telling, what, what he's telling uh, Tyler is, God has chosen you for the role of your lifetime. How will you play out your role? Will you be bitter because you've got cancer? Will you be angry at God because you've got cancer? Or will you glorify God? Will you, will you still be the same Tyler that everybody's come to know and love even though you have tormentors teasing you? And like I said, that's, that's actually the, the question that we ourselves need to ask as well. Grandpa tells Tyler that they're jealous because He's been chosen for the role of his lifetime. 
been handpicked by God. And I think that Maranatha has been ch- chosen for the role of their lifetime. We've been handpicked by God. And this was actually a good portion of what was going on yesterday at the refocus. Um, today's passage is, is 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. So if you would turn with me there in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. It'll be up on the screen. But as we read this, keep in the back of your mind, how will we play our part in this role that we've been chosen for? 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God's word tells us elsewhere that, we, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And here... It tells us that if we humble ourselves, God will, at the proper time, God will exalt us. He will lift us up. Uh, One way that it says that we can humble ourselves is to cast all of our uh, anxieties upon Him. Um, As individuals, we have to trust God enough to cast our, um, our discontent, our discouragement, our anxieties all of our anguish upon Him. We have to do that as individuals. But as a church, we still need to trust Him enough to cast all of those things upon Him too. Because as individuals, we experience those things. We experience anguish, discontent, anxiety. But as a church body, don't we experience sometimes the exact same things? So shouldn't we, as a church body, still trust in the Lord enough to cast all of those things upon him like I said Jeremy spoke last Saturday night on on, uh, worry and and he said why worry about anything and he spoke about the the flowers of the fields being dressed even Solomon wasn't dressed as as nicely as the flowers of the fields yet we worry where our clothing is going to come from the birds they don't worry they don't store up their food they God provides, so how much more will God provide for those who are created in His image? Why worry about these things? And basically, I mean, the extent of it was God is in control. God has not lost control of anything. He's not surprised. He's still sovereign, and He's still in charge. But as humans, one of the signs of a lack of submission, you might say, that's when we say we're casting everything upon Christ. That's we're submitting, we're surrendering, we're giving our sword over to Christ, and we're saying, "You are in control. I have no authority." One of the things that shows a lack of submission is impatience with God and His timing, which leads to worry, leads to discontent, it leads to anxiety over future events. What am I going to wear? What are we going to eat? Stop it. That's what Jeremy's point to the Bob Newhart video was. Again, you need to pull that video up. But how will we play our part in this role that we've been chosen for by God? Friday night, about 20 of us met in the back of the sanctuary here, and we met to pray for the church. And one of the common themes throughout the prayer of many, many people was the attacks of Satan. Um, The desire for us to resist Satan. 
A prayer that God would bind Satan from this place and not allow him in. Or as Maria said it, Satan, you're not welcome here. Leave. And that, that pretty much summed it up. Um, today's passage tells us that we need to be sober-minded and watchful. Our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion, seeking whom he might devour. That's a pretty good picture. When I found that, I was like, that's pretty neat. It, it doesn't show the rest of the body. I kind of blew it up and cropped it. But it's a lion's head on a body. And what do we read in Ephesians on the, 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 the armor of God? How is Satan described as shooting fiery darts? Right? And we need the shield of faith to protect us from Satan's fiery darts. Today it says we need to be sober-minded and watchful because our adversary, the devil, is seeking, prowling like a lion, seeking whom he can devour. We need to be sober-minded and watchful individuals, but we also need to be sober-minded and watchful as a church as well. Um, Grancy shared, actually I think it was Judith that shared this, but Grancy has something written in her Bible. And if you pull out of your bulletin, the insert, the little gray portion at the bottom, is what she has in her Bible. If you don't meet Satan when you get up in the morning, it means you are going the same direction he's going. If, if, if we're living for God and we're opposing Satan, we're going to be meeting Satan head on. Amen? If we're not meeting Satan head on, it means we're going in the same direction he is. We need to be sober-minded and watchful. A couple of weeks ago, when uh, the refocus started, and I've shared this before, and, and uh, Jay shared this morning, we, we looked at our individual selves, and we wrote on post-it notes uh, big events in our lives uh, or uh, important people in our lives, good or bad. The, the good were on yellow and the bad were on pink. And many of, my bad thing, many of the bad things, when I look back through my life, it was the pink on, on my timeline throughout my life. Oftentimes it was the pink, the bad things that happened in my life that shaped who I am. It shaped the direction of the life that I'm living, where I'm going. It, it sh helped shape my character. It helped me answer that question, how will I play my part? Just like Tyler in the film. He's going through something horrible, yet it's shaping his life as he answers that question, how will I play my part? M many of the times where, where the bad things were happening in my life, at least after, my, after becoming a Christian, my Christian years, um, it was a point where I was growing. It was a, a point where I was truly seeking godliness and trying to live a life of Christ. It's at a point where I was growing the most spiritually, which is when Satan would attack. And why is that? Satan doesn't like that. Satan doesn't mind idle Christians. That's why idle Christians don't get attacked. Satan doesn't like the Christians that go out and do something for the kingdom of God. He prowls around seeking whom he can devour. Temptations, trials, and attacks, they come. And as we, recon as we continued the refocus last night, we started to see a lot of the same things. Because we did a church timeline, like Jay was talking about, and we did the same thing. Yellow sticky notes, pink sticky notes. Yellow good, pink bad. And we said all the significant people and events that have happened in the life of Maranatha Baptist Fellowship. And there's a lot of yellow. But there's quite a bit of pink as well. But if you look at that... Um, when, when the church was flourishing, when, when the church was seeking to, to glorify God, when the church stood for what was right, guess who was right in the midst? Satan was right there. He was prowling. He was seeking whom he could devour. Temptations, trials, and attacks came. And that's where oftentimes you see all this go good going on, and then all of a sudden, a rash of pink. It's still up on the wall downstairs. You can take a look. 
In fact, I'd encourage you to join us this afternoon to continue because we're going to see, just like in my life, many of the pink bad things in my life that have shaped my character and shaped my life and helped me answer that question, how will I play my role? I bet we're going to see this afternoon that a lot of that pink is what's going to shape the character, shape the values, and shape who we are as Maranatha. Why we believe what we believe. Why will we not budge on certain things? Why is this important? Why is that important? Why is this not important? A lot of that is going to come from the bad, and we call them bad, but are they really bad when you've been blessed by growing? Um, but that's what we're going to see. It's helping us as a church answer the question, how will we play our part? Verse 9 gives us an idea of how to answer today's question. How will we play a part? Verse 9 says, resist him. That's the first way to do it. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Every church that is on track for Jesus Christ and working for God's kingdom, they get attacked. That's the way it is. All over the world, we are not alone but we need to resist him. We need to resist the temptation to be upset with one another. We need to resist the temptation to gossip, be bitter, be jealous, be at odds with any of God's people. And I mean any of God's people, not just the God's people here in this room this morning. We need to resist any temptations of being at odds with God's people. In fact, we need to resist the temptation of being odds with any people. Because what else does Scripture say? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We need, to, we, we need to resist the temptation to be at odds with our enemies as well. We need to come together in unity as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for our church. We need to exhort or lift one another up in encouragement. We need to recognize and remember God's blessing upon us. That's how it started last night was we, we, we read uh, Deuteronomy, I believe it was chapter 8, and then we read Psalm 106. And a, a lot of it was about remembering. And this morning in, in uh, Sunday school, we, we read in Amos how Amos was crying out to, to Israel, Thus saith the Lord, you've done these things, and you continue to do these things, and you have failed to remember, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt, and you have failed to remember these things. When we fail to remember what God has done for us, it messes us up. So yesterday was really good to come together and remember what significant things and people have been in the life of Maranatha. We need to remember God's blessings upon us as individuals and as a church. How will we play our part? Through suffering, uh, God works mightily. Um, just like when gold is refined by fire, um, our struggle is purifying us. It strengthens us. God uses the suffering to perfect us, uh, which is exactly what verse 10 tells us. It says God will restore us. God will confirm us. God will strengthen us. And God will establish us. God works through struggles to strengthen our character. And finally, verse 11, to God be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In letters to God, Tyler has cancer because, uh, and because of that, he's lost his hair and most of his eyebrows, um, and he's suffering. So when he goes to his grandpa, his grandpa tells him that his tormentors are jealous so it's easy to see why Tyler would have such a response. Are they jealous because I've lost my hair or most of my eyebrows? <laughs> Which one is it, Grandpa? But just like Tyler, I'd say that our tormentor, Satan, he's jealous. He wants nothing more than to see us suffer and in discord. Satan is jealous because we're now working for God and not for him. 
and he doesn't like that, and he would like to see it reversed. I, I feel much like the grandfather in, in uh, letters to God. We've been chosen as a church for the role of a lifetime. We've been handpicked by God. How will we play our role? The Apostle Paul, he was afflicted with some sort of eye problems. And um, he was satisfied with God's grace, even in that. He, he said that if he lived, he would live for God. If he died, he would go to God. So either way, it was a win situation for him. He, he, he didn't care one way or the other, but he said, well, because you guys need me, I'll probably stick around. And so he did. But how we live before others can make a tremendous impact. Oftentimes when people see that we might be the first exposure to Christ a person has. Believe it or not, there are people in Topeka that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ other than a swear word. There are people in Topeka that don't know the gospel. They don't know that Jesus is the Son of God who came to die for them. Right here in Topeka. I promise you there are people that don't know the name of Jesus. We may be the first real image of Jesus that they ever see. How will we play the part that God has for us? So this week's challenge, it's, it's not much of a challenge, but then again, it might actually be a lot. Um, on that piece of paper in the, in, in the bulletin that you looked at for Grancy's quote, you're going to see the, the question, how will we play our part? I want you to read this passage. It's on the back of it. I want you to read the passage uh, and ask for yourself, how will I play uh, my part? Individually, because we are individuals. And it's like when, in the beginning of the refocus, he said, you, you need to know where you are at individually before we can come together to see where we're at corporately. Because it's individuals that make up the church. And then I want you to ask yourself the question, how will we Maranatha, play our part. See, I see great things happening here in Maranatha. And I see great things in the future of Maranatha. I'm very encouraged, and this is supposed to be a very encouraging message. It might not have been, but it was intended to be that when we're being attacked, we're doing good because Satan doesn't attack the idol. I'm very encouraged in the participation of the refocus. Um, and I hope it continues to grow, grow in numbers, but also grow us closer to the one who's brought us together, Jesus Christ. Satan's at work, but so is God, and God is greater. So I am encouraged. God is bringing us closer together, and it's all for his glory. And I'll close with this. Let's not make it easy on him. If you can't see it and read it, the lion is the devil, and he's thinking some make it easier than others. One is laying idle, and the other is dressed in the armor of God. How will we play our part? And maybe, maybe you don't have a part in this. Maybe you don't have a part in your life right now. Maybe God... Maybe, maybe you don't have that relationship with God. Maybe, maybe you're sitting idle. Maybe you've not even started a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not hard, but yet again, it's probably the hardest thing you can ever do because you have to admit to yourself that you've lived in rebellion to God, and you have to say, God, I'm going to live for you now instead of for myself. Forgive me for living in rebellion to you and save me through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and, that you, uh, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. The wages of sin is death, but God loved us so much that he sent his Son, Jesus Christ, knowing that we would sin to die for us anyway. The Bible says if you die without him, you're condemned already. 
Don't put this off. It's an important decision. Maybe you have another decision to make. Maybe it's one of, of membership. Maybe it's one of, I, I don't know, uh, missions. W- whatever your decision, I would ask that you make that this morning. And as you, you can tell, we're going to have communion here in a little bit. But I want to give, I want to give everybody the opportunity first before we take communion to receive Christ. Because my encouragement to you is that you wouldn't, you wouldn't partake of communion unworthily, like we've talked about in, in, in the message not too long ago, last month, but that you would take it worthily. By not taking communion, you're not saying that um, it's not a shameful thing. It, it's not something to be embarrassed about. It's not, what will people think of me? It's actually showing spiritual maturity because you don't want to partake unworthily. So we're going to have a time of invitation before we get to the communion. If you have a decision to make, please feel free to come up and make that decision this morning. Would you join me in prayer, please? Dear Father God, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for all that's been going on this past month. Lord, I thank you. Uh, I thank you that Satan is showing his face because, Lord, that means we're not sitting idle. Lord, I thank you because that means we're working for you. We are working for the kingdom, and Satan doesn't like it. Lord, I thank you that you've given us, you've given us things like the armor of God that we can rely on, that we can put on every day to fight in this battle because it is a battle. It's a spiritual battle. And Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen us, that you would bring us together, that you would lift us up, and that you could receive all of the glory for it. Lord, if there's a decision that needs to be made this morning, Lord, I just pray that you would humble their hearts, that they would be able to make the decision that you've called them to. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?